Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. Uh, I'm Mary Dasso. I'm a senior investigator in the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, and I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, um, Rebecca Heald, who's the co-chair of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at UC Berkeley. She was nominated by uh, the Women's Science Advisors in recognition of her outstanding research, mentorship, and leadership in the biological sciences community. So uh, Rebecca Heald obtained her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Hamilton College. She then pursued a PhD in physiology and biophysics at the Harvard Medical School in Boston um, in the lab of Frank McKeon, and then went to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg in the lab of Eric Carsenti, where she made major contributions to our understanding of mitotic spindle formation using extracts prepared from the eggs of African clawed frogs, Xenopus labus. She joined the faculty of UC Berkeley in 1997 and became a full professor there in 2016. In 2021, she was named co-chair of the Molecular and Cell Biology Department. The work in her lab has been characterized by rigorous and creative use of frog-based in vitro systems to arrest a variety of important biological problems that have spanned scientific scales from fundamental biochemistry to organism-level features, like the overall size of frogs from different species. Okay, so these studies have addressed a number of really important problems, including mitotic spindle assembly, chromosome architecture and condensation, nuclear trafficking, um, and the use of egg extracts to identify critical mitotical regulators that serve structural and functional roles, and structural and regulatory roles during mitosis. Arguably, however, her most, some of her most beautiful studies have centered on the question of biological size control, as well as the molecular basis of variation that contributes to genomic instability and evolution. So obviously, correct size relationships are crucial for cell function, architecture, and division. And these are scaled differently between different organisms, between tissues, and even between different cell types. Before her work, however, it was essentially unknown how uh, cells were able to regulate the size of component structures and organelles. What Rebecca's lab has demonstrated is that subcellular scaling factors were present in the cytoplasm of eggs and embryos, and that they show, and then they further show that nuclear import has a key role in nuclear scaling between different sized frogs and during uh, reductive di divisions in early development. Not only did this work shed important light on the question of size control, uh, but her analysis also showed that interspecies hybrid frogs um, she used interspecies hybrid frogs to elucidate the relationships between genome, cell, and organism size in amphibians, and showed how these relationships can cause chromosome segregation defects and lead to hybrid incompatibilities. So obviously, um, Rebecca has earned many honors along the way. She was awarded the NIH Director's Pioneer Award in 2006. She was elected to as a fellow of the American Society for Cell Biology in 2017, and in 2019, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. She's also received the UC Berkeley Leon Henkin Citation for Distinguished Service as a postdoctoral mentor and for the promotion of diversity and inclusion in the life sciences. Um, this last is particularly notable because Rebecca is well known within the bi cell biology community as an excellent mentor and a consistent advocate for an open and inclusive uh, biological research community. So I've known Rebecca for many years, and I can attest that she is an extremely creative scientist, a wonderful person, and a superb mentor. I also think on this auspicious occasion, our second in-person Walls lecture, um, that we are in for a treat. So uh, the title of her talk is In Vitro Approaches to Investigate Cell Division and Biological Science Control. So thank you very much, Rebecca, for coming here, and welcome to the NIH. Thank you, Mary, and um, thank you so much. It's been, it's just a huge honor to be giving this talk and to meet people in person, and I'm glad I can also speak to people on Zoom as well. Um, so I will just get started then. Um, so, right, so my title, so Mary gave a wonderful introduction. Um, another possible title, though, for my talk is Fun Experiments That You Can Only Do With Frogs. And, um, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be um, convinced that Xenopus and other amphibians provide a great model system to study fundamental questions in biology. So um, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on how we can use Xenopus to study this question of subcellular scaling. So how do the structures within the cell um, scale to cell size? And um, we can do this in, in two ways. Um, we can, and I don't know. 
I think I'm, I'm just going to use my pointer. Uh, I'm not sure you can see anything, but it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, right. So one thing we can do is compare uh, related Xenopus species. For example, the large, uh, larger Xenopus lavis frog, which has um, a larger genome and lays larger eggs than the smaller Xenopus tropicalis um, relative of Xenopus lavis. So they scale, it seems, at all levels from the size of the genome, the size of the animal, and the size of the cells within the animal. So that's one scaling system. And the other is to compare um, subcellular scaling, to look at subcellular scaling during development after the fertilized egg undergoes these rapid cleavage divisions to generate many smaller and smaller cells in the absence of growth. So here you have the same size genome, but the cell size is getting smaller, and how do the structures within the cell adapt? Okay, so the system that is really the key to identifying the molecules that are involved in, in subcellular scaling, um, the key is this use of this in vitro system, the Xenopus egg extract system. Um, and it works because we can um, um, inject the females with a hormone that causes them to lay many eggs overnight. And they're all uh, arrested in the same phase of the cell cycle in metaphase of meiosis II. So we can collect these eggs, pack them in a tube really tightly, and then centrifuge harder, which will lyse the eggs and separate the eggs into the component um, parts, including this layer in the middle here that's the undiluted cytoplasm. So we can basically get one X cytoplasm from these eggs, and this is the only system where you can generate milliliter quantities of this, of this extract. Furthermore, because it came from eggs that are arrested in metaphase, the extract is also arrested in metaphase, and so you can use it to actually um, go through the cell cycle in vitro. So for this, we have to add a, a source of chromosomes. So most often we add uh, sperm chromosomes. So this is a single Xenopus lavis sperm nucleus that contains 18 chromosomes. So we add the, um, the sperm nuclei to the egg extract, and we can send it into interphase of the cell cycle. And, and during that phase of the cell cycle, the, the, the DNA decondenses and replicates a nuclear envelope with nuclear pores forms and you have all these interphase events happening, and it takes about an hour. Um, and then we can send the system back into metaphase and arrest it there by just adding more of our, our, our metaphase arrested extract. And now um, spindles will form, and, and these spindles are remarkable because they are exactly the same size and shape and morphology as the spindles that were in the eggs that we started with. But now we're reconstituting them with a different set of chromosomes. And so these... Um, Chromosomes, uh, they, they've replicated and they can assemble kinetochores and attach to the microtubules. Um, um, and so they're really uh, a nice uh, way to study the spindle in vitro. All right. Uh, so how we got into scaling was when we initially thought, well, we've made extracts from Xenopus lavis for many years. What about it if we make egg extracts from Xenopus tropicalis? And to our um, amazement, adding the same source of sperm chromosomes to both egg extracts um, we could see that the nuclei formed in the tropicalis extract and the spindles that formed were smaller than the same um, than the structures formed in the Xenopus lavis extract. And furthermore, if you took the two extracts, mixed them together, and then add the sperm, you got structures of intermediate size. And we were that was an aha moment um, where we realized that within these these different egg extracts were factors that were setting the size of the spindle and the nucleus. And so now we had an assay by which we could identify these factors. So um, I'm just going to um, talk about first uh, nuclear size. Um, so uh, what we found, and this was the work of, of Dan Levy in my lab, that um, if we added, if we followed the formation of the nuclei in the different extracts, the different species extracts, you can see really clearly that the Xenopus lavis in the lavis extract, there's more rapid import of a nuclear um, protein. This is just GFP with a nuclear localization sequence than in Tropicalis. Um, um, and so, and this, uh, because all substrates are being imported faster, this allows the Xenopus lavis nucleus to grow um, more quickly by importing things like the nuclear lamin proteins. And um, by comparing the two extracts, um, Dan found that Xenopus lavis egg extracts and eggs have higher levels of a really key nuclear import factor called important alpha, which will come back over and over in this talk. Okay, so lavis has higher levels of a protein that's key for nuclear import, for importing things that allow nuclear growth. So that's why um, the egg cytoplasm from Lavis generates um, larger nuclei than tr the tropicalis extract. 
Okay, what about spindles? Um, so the spindle, unlike the nucleus, is sort of growing throughout interphase, um, but the spindle actually reaches a nice uh, steady state size in the two extracts that are the same size as the, in the eggs that we started with. And what's really interesting is if you, um, um, in this experiment, we had um, tropicalis extract containing red fluorescence tubulin, um, and then we add to that trop extract uh, a, a lot more of the Xenopus lavis extract that contains green fluorescent tubulin. And that, you see very quickly within a couple of minutes, rapid exchange within the spindle. So even though the spindle reaches a steady state size, it's actually highly dynamic with the microtubules turning over very rapidly. And um, what you'll see is this turnover of tubulin in the spindle and also that the spindle gets gradually larger and larger. Um, and you can do the reverse experiment by adding trop extracts to um, lavis spindles. Um, and again, you see the exchange and you see the spindle in this case get smaller. Um, so what could be the scaling factors um, that are setting spindle length in this really dynamic structure? Uh, we had two uh, candidates that we, um, we started with um, that turned out to be really um, great candidates. And our reasoning was that microtubule stability has a lot to do with how big the spindle will, will be in the end. So the turnover rate of the microtubules themselves, how quickly they're growing and shrinking. And so we reasoned that perhaps microtubule destabilizing enzymes would be um, factors that could be varied to, to change spindle length across these two species. And our two candidates are this P60 katanin, which hopefully you know about from Antonina Rolnikak's work, um, which is a microtubule severing enzyme. Um, and then the second is a microtubule depolymerizing enzyme called KIF2A, which is a kinesin-like protein that instead of walking along microtubules, um, gets to the end of the microtubules and causes a catastrophe and causes the microtubules to shrink. So we, re we wanted to see whether either of these factors were involved in spindle scaling across these two species. Um, so uh, Rose Laughlin, when she was in the lab, set up an assay using fluorescent stabilized microtubules um, and then adding the two species extracts. And what you can see um, in um, the Xenopus lavis extract, the microtubules persist longer than in the Xenopus tropicalis extract. And if you look really closely, you can actually see that the microtubules in the Xenopus tropicalis extract are getting severed. They're getting chopped up. So that suggested that katanin is the scaling factor that might be different um, in the two extracts. Um, so unlike important alpha, which has different levels in the two species, the katanin levels in trop and lavis were the same. Um, furthermore, the proteins themselves are 95% identical in amino acid sequence. However, we identified a site that was a putative um, Aurora B phosphorylation site that was present in the Xenopus lavis katanin, but absent from the Xenopus tropicalis katanin. And um, so we came up with this model then that perhaps um, we, we, it was also known that phosphorylation attenuates the activity of katanin. So the idea was that the, in, in Xenopus lavis extracts, the, the katanin is phosphorylated, its activity is turned down. But because tropicalis lacks that phosphorylation site, it's much more active and would, would shrink the spindle. Um, and this turned out to be the case. So for example, if you, if you um, get rid of this phosphorylation site in the lavis protein, then you get smaller spindles and, and more dynamic um, microtubules. So um, in this case then, compared to the nuclear, nuclear size, which is regulated in part by levels of importance, levels of a protein, in this case it's activity and not levels that's, that's different. And, and, um, and it really comes down to a single phosphorylation site on one microtubule destabilizing protein that's an important factor in setting the spindle length differently across the two species. So this was great, but we thought, you know, is this a conserved mechanism? You know, how do other species scale the size of their spindle? Um, and so we decided to, to look in an extreme case, and that is this um, small frog called Hymenochiris boat-gary that was introduced in the lab um, by a former graduate student, Kelly Miller, who's now a postdoc in the lab. Um, so this is um, also an African frog, but it's a dwarf African frog, and it's more highly divergent from the Tropicalis and Lavis species, um, so by over 100 million years, whereas Tropicalis and Lavis are approximately 60 million years um, diverged. Okay, so here's where the really amazing technical um, feat of Kelly comes in because uh, you can see that these small frogs, they're tiny, um, lay really small leg eggs and they don't lay a lot of eggs, but yet she managed to um, make an egg extract from Hymenochiris and, and could form spindles and nuclei in these, in these extracts. So this gave us another system to, to look at spindle size control. 
Um, and uh, so the first thing we did was look at katanin in Hymenochirus, and actually the Hymenochirus katanin is like the Xenopus lavis. It has that phosphorylation site. Um, however, KIF2A, our other microtubule destabilizing factor, um, does show different behavior in, in Hymenochirus compared to Xenopus lavis. And if you just look by immunofluorescence, you see that KIF2A, although the levels are the same in the two species, you can see it more highly enriched at the poles of the spindle um, in the Hymenochirus extract. Um, and just similar in a way to the Katanin situation, um, the levels are similar um, and the sequences are very similar, but we found a, a difference again in a phosphorylation site, but a diff of a different kinase, a polokinase, another um, um, mitotic act mitotically active kinase. Um, and, but this time, the serine is found in the Hymenochirus um, KIF2A, so it's missing from Xenopus lavis. But it's known that phosphorylation of, of KIF2A by polo activates it. Okay, so now we have a very similar yet very different um, mechanism going on where um, now because Hymenochirus boat Gary has this activation phosphorylation site, um, its microtubules are less stable and it forms a smaller spindle. Um, so yeah, so this is cool because the, the theme is conserved that you have regulation of microtubule destabilizing enzymes by mitotic kinases, but that the details are very different. Um, but and anyway, we thought this was a good, um, a good other way to look at the conservation of, of this mechanism. All right, so now I'll switch to talk about um, scaling during early development. Uh, so this movie shows a set of Xenopus lavis eggs that have been fertilized and are undergoing these rapid cleavage divisions that happen every 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and this is um, a really great system to study scaling uh, because you have the, the same components are there throughout, um, but they're being divided into smaller and smaller cells. Um, and so this is happening in the absence of growth. Um, and also there's very little transcription going on, which is a big relief to me as someone who doesn't understand um, transcription and who doesn't really want to worry about compensatory mechanisms. Because we basically have a closed system here where it's a biochemically driven system where we have mostly maternal components are, are driving all of the size changes that we would see. Okay, so, so you go from you know, a single fertilized egg that's a millimeter or so across um, to these small cells. And so one obvious question is, well, maybe it's just the physical size of the cell sets the size of things like the nucleus and spindle that would have to get smaller as cells get smaller. So is there a, it's just a, a physical effect? And if that's true, then this phenomenon should be conserved widely in evolution. Um, and so a few years ago, Marina Crowder did, um, had this project called the Spindle Zoo, where she um, imaged spindles in the um, fertilized eggs and early embryos of, um, of a whole range of different species across five different phyla um, and could see really nicely how um, the spindle in the, the fertilized in the first division is quite large and then as the cells go through these rapid cleavage di divisions the spindle scales smaller so this is a phenomenon common to all animals as far as we know. Okay, so, so this raises the possibility that it really just is cell size that's setting the size of the spindle. Um, so to test this, we got together with Dan Fletcher and Mike Vahey, uh, a postdoc in his lab, and in my lab, Matt Good um, drove this project, where um, we took the extract, and after we prepared it, made all, went through the trouble of preparing the extract, we, we then put it back into compartments. And we could do this in a controlled way by making droplets of extract um, in, within an, an oil. So basically an, a frog um, salad dressing, an extract um, frog salad dressing. And so, um, so what we do to, to make this work, um, and, and we can do it in a, with a microfluidic device where you introduce um, extract with the sperm chromosomes in one channel and the oil um, and a, a lipid um, barrier in the, in, the, in the other channel. And so this lipid will, will surround the droplet. And in this case, it's a very inert lipid, so the head group of the lipid is pegylated. So the lining of the droplet is quite inert, and then it's basically surrounding the, um, the extract. And what you can see is that, sure, there is some scaling where you see in a larger droplet that spindles are, are larger than in the smaller droplets. However, um, 
they're not the size that they are in vitro, in vivo, sorry, at the same cell size. So for example, the smallest droplet here, um, at that equivalent cell size in vivo, the spindle would actually be smaller. So it's not actually mimicking the scaling that we see in vivo. Um, however, what we could determine um, with this assay is that you know, this volume-dependent scaling is probably simply due to components becoming limiting as the amount of cytoplasm becomes smaller as the cells get smaller and as the droplets get smaller. Okay, so, um, so what, what's the rest of the story then if it's not really volume-dependent scaling? So Jeremy Wilbur, when um, he was a postdoc in the lab, um, actually um, did a really cool experiment of not making extracts from, from eggs, but actually making them from embryos at different stages of development. Um, at stage three, which is a four cell stage embryo, and at stage eight, which has about 4,000 cells. And really nicely could recapitulate the spindle size that we saw in vivo in extract, um, but this is embryo extract. Um, and just like the interspecies kind of scaling, if you took the two extracts and mixed them together, you get spindles of intermediate size. Um, but you're saying, but wait, but wait, you know, this is a closed system and you have the same amount of all of these factors just getting divided into smaller and smaller cells. Um, however, um, things are changing, right? Instead of having a single plasma membrane around one cell, um, you have 4,000 cells that ha are surrounded by plasma membrane, and the extract is actually the made from the cytoplasm. So there's partitioning within the embryo of factors between the membrane and the cytoplasm, and so the extract um, is actually different from early stage and later stage embryos. So this gave us um, this idea then that maybe there's something that's partitioning with the membrane that um, is involved in scaling. And I'm going to give you the model first and then show you some of the key data. So the idea is that um, subcellular structure is scaling not with um, just cell volume, but with cell um, surface area to volume ratio. Um, and um, we come back to our friend Important Alpha, which I mentioned already that regulates nuclear size. Um, um, and, and the microtubule depolymerizing kinase in KIF2A. So in large, so we, so the key finding was that important alpha is actually palmitylated, so it can, um, it has a uh, lipid group that's attached to, that can be attached to it, and it can partition to the plasma membrane or to other uh, membranes, um, and it does so in our system. It seems rather passively. So if you have a large cell, um, then if all the important alpha that's palmitylated um, can go to the membrane, you still have a very large fraction that's in the cytoplasm, and when um, the important alpha is in the cytoplasm, it actually binds to the KIF2A and, and, and inhibits its activity. So in this case, the spindle is large. Okay, but in a small cell, now you have the same components. It's about five micromolar important alpha. It's a very abundant protein. But now, in a, a small cell, a higher fraction of it is associated with the membrane, right, because the surface area to volume ratio is much higher. So same five micromolar, but now a higher proportion at the membrane. And so now you have less important alpha in the cytoplasm, and, um, and the KIF2A, KIF2A can bind and depolymerize the microtubules and shrink the spindle. Okay, so we wanted to test this uh, model using our droplet system. So I told you that our original system had this inert lipid at the droplet boundary. Um, so what Chris Brownlee did in the lab was to use instead physiological plasma membrane lipids that we could just order to make that um, barrier around the, um, the droplet of extract. Um, and so the prediction is, and, and he could add a GFP labeled important alpha to this, um, to this reaction. And when he did that, so the prediction is that if important alpha can be, it, it's palmitylated, and if it can associate with a plasma membrane, that you would see it um, localizing to the plasma membrane that would liberate KIF2A and the spindle would get smaller. And that's indeed um, what, what we saw. So here's the GFP important alpha. You see it throughout the droplet um, with the inert lipid boundary and then localizing to the plasma membrane. And the spindle is much um, smaller. And now this actually, this scaling recapitulates the scaling that we see uh, in the embryo. And so in red is the, the relationship between the droplet and spindle length um, with the, in the presence of the inert lipid, and then in blue is with the plasma membrane lipid, and then in black is the actual embryo relationship of cell diameter to, compared to spindle length. 
So what's really beautiful about this mechanism is that, you know, I already mentioned important alpha levels regulate nuclear size. Um, so this is a way of coordinately regulating both nuclear size and spindle size um, during development. Um, and just to, to highlight this, um, so here, um, these are extracts prepared from different stage embryos that um, Dan Levy made. Um, you see the nuclei on the bottom getting smaller as he makes extracts from, from later and later stage embryos. And then you see in the western blot, if you look at the cytoplasmic levels of important alpha, they're going down. Okay. And as those levels go down, then there's reduced import of structural factors like um, the nuclear lamin proteins. So we think this is a really nice um, example of how biology has come up with a way to coordinately scale two key structures within the cell during development. We have a lot more questions. Um, and one, another one is, what about mitotic chromosomes? which must also scale to the size of the cell in order to be completely segregated, properly segregated during um, cell division. And it's been known for uh, many years that, in fact, chromosomes, uh, of course, do get smaller with, with smaller cell size. And so far, what's been uh, what's shown in the literature is comparing a blastula stage embryo to a tadpole and you, by chromosome spreads, and you can strongly see this chromosome scaling happening. Um, and so Coral um, Zhou in the lab set out to set up an assay to actually study this in vitro. Um, but before I talk about her assay, um, there's just many open questions about how con chromosomes condense in the first place. So I'm going to tell you about an assay that another postdoc in the lab has developed um, to actually follow um, mitotic chromosome um, condensation in vitro um, in a physiological um, system. Um, and this is um, Mina Sun, who worked together uh, with um, Hossein Amiri and others in the Bustamante lab at Berkeley. So she has a biophysics background. And um, she came to me with this idea of, I want to put the extract in an optical trap. And I was like, good luck with that. That's not going to work. Because the extract is so full of all kinds of membranes and particles and stuff that I never thought it would work. Um, but she made a high-speed extract that, that stayed very concentrated but got rid of all the membranes and stuff and, um, and actually got this assay to work really beautifully. So the way it works is she has um, a, a plasma DNA that's um, linearized, so, um, and she attaches one end to um, one bead that she holds with a micropipette, and then the other bead on the other end of the DNA is in the optical trap. And she fully extends um, the plasma DNA. It's 6 kb. Um, and she uses high force, 15 piconewtons, to fully extend the DNA. Um, and then um, introduces the, her high-speed egg extract. Um, and then reduces the force to about 1 piconewton. And now the proteins can bind, will bind to the DNA, and the DNA can undergo compaction um, um, right, And then she can actually follow the compaction and the force, and then she can reverse it by pulling again, increasing the force and pulling on that bead, and then basically watching the force and extension relationship. Okay, so this is really cool, I think, because it's a single molecule experiment. You're following a single plasma DNA, but it's in the highly physiological and complicated egg extract. Furthermore, it's a system that we can look at different cell cycle states. Um, and so her first experiment was to compare this compaction in interphase and mitosis. And so um, what you see on the top trace here is the, the DNA extension length. And then on the bottom is the force applied on the bead um, to extend the, 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 the DNA. And so when she lowers the force, you see this rapid sort of recoiling and then um, a compaction happening. And what you see is that in interphase, the DNA, the single DNA will compact to about half of its um, length. Um, and this takes about, yeah, less than a minute, two minutes max. So it's really, really fast. And actually, this makes sense that um, this process would be very rapid. Um, and then um, at the same time scale, on the, on the right here is the mitotic um, um, extract. And you see even more rapid um, compaction and also almost to the point where the beads are touching each other. So now um, we're in a great position to ask, what is the contribution of individual molecules to this behavior, to this compaction behavior? So for example, we can get rid of, prevent core histones from binding, linker histones, um, key enzymes like condensin and topoisomerase. So we're working on that now. So now to, just to come back, so this is a great ex example, I think, of the power of the Xenopus system to provide a physiological assay to look at, at chromosome dynamics. 
So coming back to this question of how mitotic chromosome scale um, in Coral's project, um, she uh, built on an assay developed by a previous postdoc, Esther Keisterman, in the lab. Um, and, and this is a really cool assay, but we're actually having second thoughts about it. So um, anyway, I'll tell you about the assay and our, what we're worried about now. So OK. So the problem is it's really hard to make extracts from embryos and, and have them behave the way they, the egg extracts do. So the, our first assay um, was to actually prepare nuclei from different stage embryos. So fertilize a batch of eggs and then collect them, for example, at the 4,000 stealth stage or later in development. Um, and before we collect them, um, uh, Isol tr treat them with cyclohexamide so that all the nuclei are in G2 of the cell cycle. So the DNA has replicated. Um, and so we can do this before or after activation of the zygotic genome. Um, and so then we have these nuclei from different stages of development that should have replicated chromosomes. And now we can plunk them into our metaphase arrested extract, which is actually a meiotic extract, right, from, made from the eggs. Um, and then um, allow the findle spindles to form and isolate the chromosomes and measure them. And to compare, we can use our good old um, sperm nuclei um, to compare. And what um, Coral found is that, that chromosomes from these embryo, that form from these embryo nuclei are much shorter, or about half the length, um, as the replicated sperm chromosomes. So same chromosomes, but just much more condensed if they come from um, uh, embryo nuclei. And together with Job Decker's lab, she did um, some high C analysis, which could really show how the chromosome architecture is changing as the chromosome shrinks. Um, so the, the loops are extruded that along this axis of the, of the chromosome, and that um, as the chromosome gets smaller, um, the loops get much bigger and the axis gets shorter. And so that um, was information that we could get from our in vitro chromosomes by doing high C analysis. So what is causing this reorganization um, of, the, of the chromosomes? Um, and so to, do, to look at this, she started by um, just doing immunofluorescence of the single chromosomes that she could isolate from the, the different reactions. And for example, showing here that condensin levels are actually higher on the sperm chromosomes, on the long chromosomes, than on the short chromosomes formed from the embryo nuclei. And so she did a, a series of um, um, immunofluorescence experiments and could see that um, whereas H1 levels go up on, on uh, embryo chromosomes, both condensin 1 and topo 2 go down. Um, and this is um, really interesting. So, so definitely things are, are changing, but why are they changing? And really, does this reflect what's happening in vivo? Um, and so we're now trying to collect in vivo chromosomes from, from embryos to actually compare. And, and what is regulating the localization of different factors to these mitotic chromosomes? Is there also some regulation by important alpha, for example? All right, so that's all I'm going to say um, for now about scaling. And now we're going to um, talk about some extreme cell biology. And this is um, what is the consequence of really large genomes? And for this, um, Kelly, again, um, she's our frog uh, whisperer. She's introduced into the lab a species called Xenopus longipes, um, which um, is its claim to fame is that it has 12 copies of the frog genome. So it's 12N, a dodecaploid frog. Um, it's, but it's a small frog with really big eyes and feet. It's very cute. Um, and she's been working together with a postdoc, Clotilde Kadar, in the lab. So now we have this amazing smorgasbord of frog species, um, from Hymenochiris, our tiny little frog, um, to Xenopus lavis, our big fat frog. And then we have different genome sizes um, across these frogs, too, with um, Xenopus longipes having um, about three times more DNA per cell than humans have. OK, so what makes this a really fun system is that there's this really old observation, this fascinating phenomenon that cell size scales with genome size. Um, and the classic experiments were done in salamanders by making polyploid salamanders and seeing that uh, three cells could make up a single kidney tubule if you had a, you know, a polyploid salamander. So um, yeah, so there's this conserved relationship. Nobody really knows why. Um, but it, it happens in normal um, 
animals as well, um, and where you have endo-replication cycles and a single cell will generate many copies of its genome, and that enables the cell to grow really large, like our liver cells, for example. Um, but the winner for this is um, the sea slug, Aplysia, which has um, 300,000 copies of its genome in uh, some of its neurons, which can measure a millimeter or more across, so really cool. So what I'd like to learn before I die is what is the molecular basis of this genome size, cell size um, scaling relationship? I think it's a really fundamental mystery. Um, it has nothing to do with gene copy number, it's just the amount of DNA. Um, it can have something to do with gene copy number, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, and then what are the consequences of having such a large genome for cell division, for development? You have all this extra DNA, you have many chances of of errors or, or DNA damage and so on, um, and how does this affect physiology? Um, so first of all, just to um, confirm in our system that cell size scales with genome size, we can look at the um, red blood cells, which are nucleated um, in amphibians, and see this really nice linear scaling um, relationship between genome size and cell size. And so one question we started with is asking, you know, we have these different frog species, when during development is this, this strong relationship between genome size and cell size established? Because very early in development, cell size is going to directly relate to egg size. And these species have very different egg sizes, with um, Xenopus longipes, with a huge genome, actually having smaller eggs than Xenopus lavis. Okay, so initially the cells in, in Xenopus longipes, of course, are going to be smaller. Um, and um, yeah. And so um, Kelly has been looking at this question, and um, so we were expecting to see scaling relationships emerge um, really rapidly. But even at one day old, if you look and you compare um, Xenopus longipes cell size and nuclear size to Xenopus lavis, you see that um, that there's not that the Xenopus longipes nuclei are quite are still smaller than Xenopus. Oh wait, longipes is nuclei are larger, but their cells are smaller or about the same size. And then if you wait another day and look again, you still ha haven't quite normalized the, the NC ratio. Um, so just to, so yeah, this is just comparing the animals the, and the cells, and this is at the tail bud stage, so they're about two days old. Okay. Um, so you're starting to see now that longipede cells and nuclei are a little bit um, larger than in Lavis. Um, so this is basically happening gradually, and now Kelly has um, determined that you don't have full NC ratio establishment until day seven. So the animals still have not fed, they haven't eaten anything, but this, it takes them that long to, to um, establish their NC ratio. So what happens to do that? You know, there has to be a balance between growth and division, and how is that working, and this is something we're really interested in. Okay, so another thing we can look at right off the bat is what are the physiological consequences of having a large genome size? And so here's our cute little Xenopus longipes. And in this movie, um, is it playing? You'll see um, uh, two, two Xenopus lavis embryos on the left and two longipes on the right. Um, and so we're filming them right after fertilization. And what you can see is that um, they're actually, their cleavage divisions are happening at exactly the same frequency early on. Um, and that development seems pretty similar until they get to about the neurula stage. Um, and then uh, eventually you'll see that the shape changes of the embryo happen more slowly in Xenopus longipes. Um, and yeah, and you can see them start to swim away. And it just takes the longipes a bit longer. So we're really curious, you know, what does the genome size have to do with this? Um, and we'll, so just, just to summarize then, we know that this across species, this, um, sub, this NC um, scaling um, takes a while to be established. And, and of course, it depends on the size of the egg that you start with as well as the size of the genome. Um, that lo Xenopus longipes development occurs at a similar rate as Lavis, um, it, but it, gradually it, it slows down. Um, so we really want to know how this is affecting development and whether um, there are changes in gene expression um, in Xenopus longipes um, and, yeah, how is this affecting its, its physiology. And um, one really interesting thing that I've started to think about is 
um, how egg resources are distributed across these different frog species that have different genome sizes and different cell sizes and different egg sizes. And just to um, give you an example, so here's, um, here are our, our five frog species I've talked about um, with their genome size and also underneath their egg sizes. And um, my favorite frog may be Zen, um, Hymenochiris boat gary. It's a small frog. It has a genome that's actually larger than Xenopus tropicalis, but it has a really tiny egg. And I wonder whether this has something to do with the fact that Hymenochiris is the, um, the tadpoles when they hatch are only about a millimeter long, and they immediately start to hunt prey. So they have no resources left in their eggs because their eggs had to just provide, you know, enable them to develop, but no yolk. Whereas Xenopus labus, can, you can leave them for a week without feeding them. And furthermore, these are predators. They're the smallest known vertebrate predators, so they go after these baby brine shrimp. Um, yeah, so I, that's, I'm really curious to find out about resource allocation across these different species. Um, so that species comparison is fascinating, um, but it's not, uh, doesn't really help us much with molecular mechanisms um, in, in this set of experiments yet. Um, but what we, another approach we can use to, is to actually change genome size within a species by generating polyploids. And um, Clotilde is working on this project. And um, I'll tell you about her work comparing diploid Xenopus labus to triploid Xenopus labus. So if you simply um, cool the, the fertilized eggs, right, right after you fertilize, you cool them down, that blocks the second polar body extrusion. So within the egg, you still have two copies of the female genome and one of the male genome. So um, easy way to make triploids, which we can confirm um, by chromosome spreads. But the animal size, interestingly, is not affected, and the developmental rate doesn't seem to be affected. So the first thing we did was to check whether this affects um, cell size within the tadpoles. And so if we compare two-day-old tadpoles and just look at their epithelial cells on the surface, um, we can see two types of cells, the, the epithelial cells and the multiciliated epithelial cells that are more bright um, red. And it's really easy to see that in the triploid, the, um, the cells are larger. And we've looked at other tissues as well, and it seems like throughout the embryo, if you have a larger genome size, um, by two days, you have um, this nice scaling relationship established. So um, what Clotilde set out to do was to ask whether this effect on cell size actually affected metabolism of the embryos. Um, and she um, figured out an assay to look at this by taking individual tadpoles and putting them into little vials with an oxygen sensor. And then she could watch the um, reduction in oxygen levels over time. And then she would very carefully take the tadpole out and weigh it, blood it dry, weigh it three times, um, because it turns out the weight of the tadpole is super important to see effects on metabolism. And so what she sees is that over time during development, the, the mass of the tadpole increases, but that's because of water cavities forming within the body. So it has nothing to do with growth, and these are not feeding tadpoles. Um, OK, so what she found when she did this really careful um, analysis is that if she compares um, diploids, which are green, and triploids, which are yellow, that initially their oxygen consumption rates per mass are about the same. Then um, at sort of day two, you see actually that the triploids have a higher OCR per mass. Um, and then that, that drops by day three and stays below the metabolic rate of the diploid from then on. Um, so what's up with that? So it's a really cool um, observation, I think, um, that an increase in ploidy leads to an increase in cell size, and it affects whole body metabolism at the same weight. So this is breaking Kleiber's law, which is pretty cool. Um, so next, we'd really like to know why these metabolic differences are happening and if it has anything to do with cell proliferation rate or what are the factors that are different, um, and to identify them and using omics types uh, of approaches. Um, and Clotilde is also wondering whether we can study this at the single cell level by she's made cell lines from different species and from different ploides to compare um, as well. Okay. So in the last part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about one more um, amazing use of uh, frog systems, and that is to study hybridization outcomes. Um, and so we're all familiar from, with hybrids from the grocery store. Um, and Xenopus labus itself is a hybrid, an allotetraploid um, species that 
um, evolved from two, the hybridization of two tropicalis-like ancestors um, about, um, yeah, it's 34 million years ago. They have not done a lot with their time. But anyway, they're, it's great, a great system to compare. Um, and so we have um, Xenopus lavis is one of the allotetrapoids, and then there's another one called Xenopus borealis that I'll talk about in a minute, compared to Xenopus tropicalis. OK, so hybridization is really common um, in biology, but it doesn't always work well, no matter how hard we try. Um, but we can do lots of fun experiments um, with these different frog species. Um, it's known that often when hybrids are inviable, it's due to genome conflicts that um, when, when you make the cross, then one set of chromosomes is eliminated or there's some issue with chromosome segregation. Um, and yeah, so we set out to, to study this using our different Xenopus species. And so I mentioned um, we have three species that we're using in these experiments, Xenopus lavis, um, our workhorse frog, Xenopus tropicalis, and Xenopus borealis. And this work was initiated by Roman Jabot, who now has his own lab in Rennes, France, and Michael Kitaoka, who's about to graduate. Sob. OK, so right. All right, so what we can do is we can take the eggs and the sperm, because they're externally fertilized, it's really easy. We can take the eggs and the sperm from different species and just combine them. And so if we take either the borealis or lavis eggs and fertilize with tropicalis sperm, we actually get um, viable embryos, and they can even um, develop all the way to the adult frog stage. We have one in the lab. And what's really interesting is that they're actually intermediate in size. They have um, a hybrid genome, so 10 chromosomes from TROP and 18 from LAVIS, and um, basically an intermediate-sized genome, intermediate-sized cells, intermediate-sized animals, so very cool scaling system. Uh, but if we do the reverse, where we um, um, fertilize tropicalis eggs with either LAVIS or borealis sperm, this does not work at all, um, and the embryos die very early in development. Um, and so we were really curious as to why they're dying. Um, and I should mention that um, these kind of hybridization experiments were done by John Gurdon's lab uh, many, many years ago, but without sort of the, the tools to really figure out what was going on. Okay, so to show you how they die, um, it's in this movie here. So on the left is the Xenopus tropicalis control, and then in the middle, trap fertilized with lavis sperm, and on the right with borealis sperm. And what you see is their development seems to be going fine, and then all of a sudden, all the cells in the lavis trop hybrid basically explode. And then in the borealis trop hybrid, they die at a similar time, but through a very different mechanism um, called extragastrulation. And the cells themselves are still alive at that point. Um, OK, so what, um, what really excited us is that when we, we actually looked at these embryos and what was going on, we could see that there were lots of um, chromosome segregation defects happening in the hybrids, um, where you saw lagging chromosomes and chromosome bridges and micronuclei forming as a result of these segregation defects. Um, and then when we sequenced, did whole sequencing, whole genome sequencing of the embryos just prior to death, um, we saw that actually it was always the paternal genome that was affected. And so in green is the Xenopus lavis genome, and in blue the tropicalis, and in purple the borealis. And what this plot shows is the areas where you see the black um, marks are, these are the chromosomes where large regions of the chromosomes have been lost or way, way underrepresented in the genome sequence. So there are whole large regions of chromosomes that are being lost, presumably because they're being isolated in these micronuclei and getting degraded. Um, but it's kind of interesting that in both cases it's the paternal genome that's not compatible somehow, that's getting, parts of it are getting eliminated, but it's different chromosomes for Xenopus lavis compared to Xenopus borealis, and this may be why the death phenotypes are different. Um, so what could be underlying these incompatibilities? So our um, best guess was something to do with the centromere, which is known to be rapidly evolving and to generate um, barriers across species. Um, and so this is where our egg extract system, again, really comes in handy because we could now just add um, our Lavis or Borealis sperm chromosomes to our tropicalis egg extract. So we could reproduce this hybridization reaction in vitro with the eggs and the sperm of the different 
um, species. And what we noticed in both reactions with either Labus or Borealis sperm, that in the tropicalis cytoplasm, if you replicated these chromosomes, initially they would have this marker for the centromere called SEMP-A. Um, but after replication, we would find these whole chromosomes that are missing an obvious centromere. And the centromere is required to form the attachment site to the microtubules of the spindle at the kinetochore to allow their accurate segregation. Um, so we reasoned that this centromere defect is underlying the chromosome segregation defects that's giving rise to these loss of, of genomic DNA. Right, so is there some kind of mismatch um, between certain centromeres of some chromosomes and the maternal components in the tropicalis egg or egg extract? Um, and so we could um, do some cool experiments, for example, adding back um, the other species SEMP A, so this core centromere component. We can add that back to, the, to our hybrid in vitro reaction. So we can in vitro translate the paternal Xenopus lavis SEMP A, for example, add that to our tropicalis extract with our lavis chromosomes, allow them to replicate, and now again look to see whether centromeres can now, can now form. Um, and so this is um, um, the percentage of SEMPE labeled chromosomes on the y-axis. And so you see, um, we never see 100% of the chromosomes with centromeres just because of the immunofluorescence reaction is, is not perfect. Um, but you see in the trop egg plus trop cr chromosome um, control, you have about 95% of the chromosomes have um, SEMPE nicely localized at their centromeres. But it goes down to about 82% when you add the lavis sperm. Okay, so, so a subset of these lavis chromosomes is completely failing to localize um, the SEMP A at their centromeres. Now we can add back Xenopus tropicalis SEMP A, and we don't really see a, a significant effect. But if we add back the paternal SEMP A, the Xenopus lavis SEMP A, in our reticulocyte lysate to the reaction, now we can partially rescue, and if we add together with the SEMP A, its loading factor, its chaperone called HDRP, now we can fully rescue um, the, all the chromosomes will now form nice centromeres. Um, yeah, so that worked really well for the tropicalis lavis hybrid, but the borealis, la uh, sorry, tropicalis lavis, and now we're talking about tropicalis borealis. Okay, so if we try the same experiment by adding um, borealis factors, it doesn't work at all. So even adding um, other centromere factors, kinetochore factors, didn't um, rescue. And so there seems to be multiple mechanisms that are causing this loss of um, centromere formation that's leading to the chromosome segregation defects. Um, what was interesting in the borealis reaction in vitro is that we saw the chromosomes were taking on a subset of them were having this really bizarre morphology that looked like a stretched chromosome or a, a, a highly decondensed region. Um, and so um, we were wondering whether that um, was reflecting some conflict uh, between polymerases um, on the chromosome, and perhaps that there's transcription is happening at certain loci, and that this is um, um, interfering with DNA replication and centromere formation somehow, and generating these fragile sites. Um, so um, to look at this, we, our first candidate was um, RNA Paul one because this secondary constriction, so it, it, as it's called in Drosophila, has actually been seen to happen at rDNA loci. And so we wondered whether the stretched um, region that we're seeing was due to some kind of uh, um, recruitment of Paul one inappropriately in the hybrid. Um, and so um, Myco did immunofluorescent staining for um, RNA-Pol1 on the borealis chromosomes incubated in the tropicalis egg extract and could see enrichment of um, Pol1 at these sites. Um, and then the most uh, remarkable experiment is that if she simply inhibits Pol1 with a drug that causes it to fall off of the DNA, um, she could fully rescue both the SEMP-A localization to the borealis chromosomes in the TROP extract, and also this morphology defect um, also goes away. So there's something going on with the, with the RDNA and the polymerase and replication that is causing centromere defects and causing these chromosome morphology defects. So, um, so I say multiple mechanisms, but I think there might, they might actually be related and that perhaps there's also um, conflicts happening in the, in the Lavis 
Tropicalis hybrid, but we can rescue those, whereas we cannot rescue the ones um, in the Borealis trop hybrid. Um, but these mechanisms include, you know, the ability of new SEMP A to load onto um, a chromosome from another species, and that we can enhance this by adding paternal factors, and also that there's a replication stress that's happening, particularly at RDNA, that's interfering with centromere formation. So the last experiment I want to show you is um, now that we can actually do these in vitro experiments and um, find conditions that rescue um, the segregation, re rescue chromosome morphology in vitro, um, can we actually rescue the hybrids by doing similar treatments in vivo? Um, and so uh, what uh, Maiko did was in the, um, the trop Lavis hybrid, she injected into the fertilized egg the, the paternal SEMP A and HDRP to restore centromere assembly. And when she did, she could see a reduction in the, um, in the number, of nuclei, number of micronuclei, so she could reduce the chromosome segregation defects. Or in the trop borealis hybrid, just treat with that POL1 inhibitor, and that also um, resulted in fewer cells with micronuclei. Okay, so here's the, the big experiment then. What's your prediction? Can hybrid embryo viability be rescued? You can make your, cast your votes and see. Uh, no. They still all die whether or not you do these treatments that will actually at least partially rescue the chromosome segregation issues um, in vitro. So there's an incomplete rescue, which may mean that that's because we couldn't fully rescue the centromere formation um, in the hybrid embryos, or it could be that there are other incompatibilities, for example, um, be between the mitochondrial and the nuclear genome. Okay. Uh, so to summarize then, um, inviable Xenopus hybrids have these chromosome segregation defects, and they're always specific to the paternal uh, genome, um, and that we can use our in vitro system to identify defects in, in centromere and um, kinetochore assembly that we think underlie these chromosome segregation problems, and that DNA um, replication stress seems to be an important factor. Um, now we really want to know why only specific paternal chromosomes are affected. What are the loci near? Where is the RDNA relative to the centromeres? We know it's actually not on the same chromosomes as the centromeres that are getting um, messed up, so stay tuned. Um, and then what, finally, what are the other causes of hybrid inviability? So finally, I'd just like to um, um, end by, by saying how, um, you know, how big a pleasure, huge a pleasure it's been to work um, in this exciting experimental system with this incredibly talented group of trainees that I've, I've had the pleasure of working with over the years, and it's really wonderful to be able to share this all with you. I, I think what makes it really fun is that we're addressing questions that, you know, that there are drawings about from, you know, centuries ago of, of, you know, how does the, what's the spindle, how does scaling happen, um, what's the relationship between the size of the nucleus and the size of the cell and speciation and so on. Um, so it's a great privilege, privilege to be a scientist right now. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank the members of my lab, the current and past members that I've mentioned, um, my many collaborators, my awesome, awesome funding from NIGMS. I have AMIRA, which is wonderful, um, and the National Xenopus Resource. And I'm happy to take any questions. So if anyone's free to uh, use the mic, I do have one from the online I'll read first. And I was actually curious if this might be related. You had five species, and I was curious um, is there's a difference, significant difference in their lifespans? Ah, uh, um, yeah, the hymenochiris, the smallest ones, have the shortest um, lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, the longipes spend most of their life as a tadpole in the wild, mm. and they grow very big. And then the only adults that have been, so they're only found in a single lake in Cameroon, Africa, so highly endangered. And the adults are all emaciated, and the tadpoles are huge. So mm. their, their um, life style is no, not characterized. Oh. Well, here's the question. Could um, mitotic scaling be related to bigger organisms living shorter lives? Perhaps uh. larger mitotic complexes have more mistakes and entro en entropic chaos than uh. smaller and tighter spindle, i.e., 
a smaller complex might have lower entropy and therefore be more organized and less susceptible to genetic errors? Question mark. That is a cool question, and I have no idea. Okay. Um, I don't. I think we're still we're in a range where entropy. Where I don't think that there's going to be huge differences in the in the chaos going on. I think they're all really chaotic. Um, but this question of spindle size and and chromosome segregation uh, fidelity is super interesting and something that we'd like to look at. Rebecca, is this on? Hi. Um, I've probably asked this, I don't know, 10 years ago. I have two questions. One is, um, are any of these frogs deployed so that you can do things like CRISPR? Yeah, and actually you can do CRISPR on, on any of them. Um, and you get mosaic animals. So doing actually making um, mutant frogs is, would be not a very good idea because they're it takes so long for them to reach maturity. But you can do F0 knockouts with CRISPR, and that's been u being used a lot. But you typically get mosaic animals. What about knock-ins? Because the question is, can you knock in a mutant kinesin or a mutant uh, um, yeah. katanin well, and get a different sized frog? <laughs> oh, yeah. Different sized frog, I don't think so because of the, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't guess because I think you have to have a maternal effect to do that, and uh -huh. um, like. Ah, okay. But, um, but yeah, we can, and we can certainly express RNAs of any kind that we want. Um, uh, yeah. So the strength of the system is definitely not genetics. Yeah, but the question is whether those things you don't think those would be sufficient. No. Okay. Because no. you need the maternal. Yeah. The, the quantity a, and that comes think about from resources. Think. Yes. I mean, I think post-adult, you know, growth and, you know, the, so I think we're really focused on embryogenesis where I don't think that you, you can change the size of the cell but not change the size of the animal. Okay. The second question is in the part about the cytoplasm to nucleus ratio and the plasma membrane, I thought, I didn't, I mean, are these things making more plasma membrane as they go? They're, it's all stockpiled. So the, so the nanomembrane isn't changing. The, the, the amount the ratio of membrane isn't, isn't changing, but it, its form is changing. Okay, so it's availability? It's availability. Where is it, like hiding in the ER or something? Um, I don't know where it's hiding. There are big lipid droplets, and there, you know, there's a lot. I mean, the embryo has to have everything for But it's not that the plasma membrane is like... Super no. convoluted. No, but you know, you, you've seen those annulet lamellae, like there's storage for like nuclear pores. I mean, the, the egg is just the most amazing thing because it has stored exactly what you need. Like it stores the, uh, so for example, in But it's not at, at the surface of the cell. It's not, no. Okay, so it's coming out of either yeah. the ER or a lipid droplet or something mm -hmm. like that that is not available to be surface area. Right, although you do see important alpha going to some internal membranes. For some reason, that doesn't seem to affect its ability to inhibit whatever or bind stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Hi, hi, Rebecca. Okay. I have two questions regarding the last part about hybrid inviability. In mm -hmm. I'm curious um, what determines the embryos to die, you know, the timing that they die. It looks like they are dividing fine, but probably accumulating a nucleotide, and suddenly they mm -hmm. just explode. Is it the timing that transcription kickoffs? Yes, it's right when the zygotic genome should really be fully active. And so what's interesting is that a haploid actually lives much longer than a hybrid, mm -hmm. right? So it's not um, the amount of DNA. It's actually probably a, an imbalance in metabolic and other factors. And, and so it's, yeah. Yeah, but it definitely has to do with now we need the zygotic genome to work, and it's incomplete, so it doesn't work. Interesting. Another quick question is that it looks like they are inviable when you cross smaller egg with big yeah. I'm just curious if you could make double-sized egg, you know, fuse them somehow, uh -huh. and then maybe restore some of yeah, them. Yeah, we, we tried a little bit of that, but the answer is no. Okay. I don't think that that will help. I think um, it's really not related to size. We can also make... Um, uh, triploids, you know, we can change genome mm -hmm. size to cell size ratio, and yeah. they're viable. So it has, n it's not really a mismatch between the this, this size of the egg and the size of the genome that it's fertilized with. But I think larger eggs may be easier to hybridize than mm -hmm. small, and that th these tetraploid animals ha might have more genetic diversity, which mm -hmm. allows them to make mm -hmm. hybrids more easily. Right. Thank you. Maybe one. 
with me? Okay. So maybe uh, one more online, and then and then you can ask your question. Um, really interesting, uh, perhaps naive question, but to what degree of homology between CENP-A from different species? Can yeah. a sequence or sequences be identified that rescues the hybrid defect? Um, yes, um, absolutely. I think, so SEMP-A, there, there are um, even single residues that have been identified that are responsible for its um, species-specific, sort of sequence-specific targeting across different species. Um, and so uh, there are some slight differences in SEMP-A across these species that correlate with their SEMP-A, their targeting domain. So for sure, um, the, it's the sequence of the DNA is evolving and, and the SEMP-A is co-evolving. Um, and yeah, and so we're messing that up when we make a hybrid. Okay, maybe one more question cases. over here, and then you can come down later because we're a little past the hour. Hey, David from Talk. Thank I you. was wondering about important alpha, uh, because as you said, it looks like the palmitoylation is important for... Uh, so I was wondering while progression of embryogenesis, how much of that changes, and is it under some kind of transcriptional regulation? Mm -hmm. um, good question. So uh, I don't know about transcription, but we know that it's um, regulated by phosphorylation, and that uh, if it's phosphorylated by um, CK2, it can no longer be palmitylated. Um, so um, most of the, um, of the, all the proteins, I would say even 80% of a tadpole is still made of maternal proteins. So there is some gene expression, but my guess is important alpha levels are mostly maternally driven, um, but phosphorylation can regulate its ability to associate with the membrane and bind cargoes. Thank you. And there, by thanking Rebecca for a really outstanding seminar and for coming to visit us and being, a, being our second live speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.